where he did when the White Sox won the World Series in 2005, leading off. And a cutter to open the game, strike one to Podsednik. The Royals will not have to deal with Carlos Quinton in this series. A little high, one ball, one strike. Two and one. Beautiful night. Temperature close to 90 in some parts of Kansas City today. Three and one to Podsednik. Right now, 85 degrees. We started on time at 7:10. Time and temp brought to you by the parking spot. Easy to spot, easy to park. The parking spot at KCI. And Podsednik grounds out, so Bannister comes up with the right pitch on three and one. And one away. Royals defense, David DeJesus and Willie Bloomquist in center field tonight with Jose Guillen, Mark Tian. Third consecutive start for Luis Hernandez at short. And Miguel Olivo will call the game for Bannister. And we've seen Willie in center field, but this is his first start out there. Coco Chris still bothered by the sore shoulder. But it was Trey Hillman's decision to keep him out. Coco was ready to get back in the lineup, but after coming out of the game early on Tuesday, Trey gave him Wednesday off, yesterday an off day, and now a third straight day where he's not in the lineup. Well, Trey pretty much uh, said he took it out of his hands. He basically want to make sure that he doesn't have a, a situation where he may lose him for a long period of time. So he's just going to take him day to day, and then they'll make that decision on that basis. Royals have pitched Alexi Ramirez very well this year. He's only two out of 18. Two out of 19. Two down in the first inning. So two ground balls from Brian Bannister and now Jermaine Dye. Well, you see Rusty Coots there. He's the outfield coach, Ryan. He's really doing, he's going to have to pay a lot of attention to Willie Blomquist and Centerville today. So he's going to be up on that top step. Rusty, you know, just, for, I mean, uh, Willie will know exactly where it is between him on every hitter. Seventh position that he has played this year. So he's been everywhere but pitcher and catcher. He did the same thing with the Seattle Mariners in his years there. Played every position but pitcher and catcher. Oh and two on Jermaine Dye, former Royal earlier this year, hit his 300th career home run. 12 home runs this season, 31 driven in. Well, I had a talk with uh, Jermaine and Jim Tomey both before the game, and I asked him about those milestones. Uh, I asked him if there was any additional pressure when you know there's a milestone coming. And he said the basic pressure is you, it's hard not to know about it because they're writing about it a lot more, they're talking about it a lot more. They mentioned you with different icons that that you come that you've read about and played against and he said the biggest pressure though comes from trying to get it over too fast. So the approach changes you do something different than what got you there in the first place. <laughs> That's true and he also went on to say that uh, Ken Griffey Jr. is probably the the most mild mannered guy when it, when it's coming into a. Uh, Bloomquist goes all the way back in center. And Jermaine dies. It is 311th home run of the year. So 13th of the year. And the White Sox lead 1-0. Uh, this is Jermaine Dye's 53rd home run here at Kauffman Stadium. And uh, he left a cutter right out over the middle of the plate. And Jermaine really... Really hit the ball well, and you mentioned the temperature, Ryan, being somewhere around the high 80s early. And now the ball is starting to travel a little bit better as it gets hotter. But uh, this is this is not a bad thing right here. That's one run, and uh, it, as long as you don't walk anybody in front of these guys, you're still in the ball game. Comes back with strike one on Jim Tomey, who continues to move up the all-time list in home runs. With 549, he is 13th all time. He passed Mike Schmidt earlier this year. 
Yeah, just finish up my story about Tommy on Ken Griffey. He said he when he goes into milestones, he just think this guy doesn't even care. He's just so relaxed and, and you wouldn't think he's any additional pressure at all. Close pitch, two and two. Well, a nice shift on uh, Jeff Tomey and Roberto Carrasco is probably 30, 40 feet out in in the uh, in right field. And Billy's a little bit closer to the line against Tomey. Bannister comes back, strikes out Tomey after the home run given up to Jermaine Dye. By M and I Bank, Willie Bloomquist leading off for the Royals this year, the fourth Royal to do that with the Jesus Butler, DN, Jacobs, and Tian, Kayaspo, Olivo, and Luis Hernandez starting for his third consecutive game, all against left-hander Clayton Richard. Well, Ryan Clayton Richard's got a 96 mile an hour fastball, so he, he does like to mix it both sides of the plate, but uh, opponents are hitting 226 first time up. And second time around, now that's a big one. 351 second time through the lineup. 91 with a fastball on Bloomquist. And what a play at second base by Chris Getz, college teammate of Clayton Richard at the University of Michigan. Well, this is just strictly a play where uh, he, he just should know that Willie Blunkers likes to go that way. And that's an ex the dive is an extension of running out of steps. The rest of the White Sox defensively put Sednick, Anderson, and Die in the outfield with Fields, Ramirez, Getz, and Canerco. Veteran A.J. Pierzynski in the league has been running all over not only Pierzynski, but the White Sox. 33 stolen bases against him. But as a whole, opponents are 41 out of 45 in stolen base attempts. So that can add a dimension to the Royals' offense tonight. Yeah, I kind of like to go back and see how many pitch outs they've had. And, and, and because normally when your catcher's having problems throwing, you try to pitch out a little bit more to try to help him out. Two and one to David. Four hits and 11 at bats in the Tiger series with a run driven in. Checks in tonight at 244. Late on a fastball at 95. So Richard strikes out his first. Two down in the bottom of the first. We talked about his fastball, and uh, this is just right down the middle of the plate, and 96 miles an hour, that's, that's pretty good from a lefty. Just making his third start. And was moved into the rotation when Jose Contreras was sent to the minor leagues. One ball, no strikes on Billy Butler. So that's actually a break for the Royals, even though Contreras hasn't had a good year. He's one of those guys that seems to always do well against the Royals. 
Royals won't have to face him. Well, he does it. Contreras is one of those guys that changes speech very well, and, and uh, usually that gives a lot of hitters problems. And uh, you know, the fastball, 95, 96, hitters can get used to that, but it's that change of speeds that gets them off balance. Two and one to Billy. Three hits and an RBI against the Tigers. Clayton Richard played baseball and football at Michigan. His second year with the Wolverine football team, he threw 15 passes, but in his next year decided to concentrate on baseball exclusively. But he is quarterback in the big house. Billy fouls it away, three and two. Well, you can see why the San Diego Padres asked for him in that trade if they'd have gone through for Peavy. I mean, you see a left hander that throws 96 miles an hour, you got to look at him, especially if he's in the strike zone. And after being rumored to be a part of that trade, Clayton Richard came out on Saturday against Pittsburgh and threw six shutout innings and struck out eight. That's under the glove of Fields. And cut off before it gets into the left field corner by Putsednik. He ruled a single for Billy Butler and a runner at first with two outs. But what Josh Fields does right here, he starts retreating on this ball, and the ball played him. He should have attacked this ball and made this hop shorter, and it would have been an easier play for him. Once he starts going backwards and got to the side, he, he was at the mercy of the ball at that point. Speaking of college quarterbacks, Josh Fields, quarterback at Oklahoma State. Now 1-0 on Jose Guillen. Homered had two RBIs in the Royals Tigers series. Now batting at 288. About 10 days ago, the White Sox starting rotation was really struggling. I mean, really struggling. That's about the time that the White Sox and the Padres came up with the deal for Jake Peavy, which he eventually rejected. But since then, the rotation has really picked it up, almost as if they took it as a wake-up call from their general manager, Kenny Williams. But in the last nine games, White Sox starters are 6-2 and two with an ERA under 2. Into center, Ryan Anderson waits for it to come down. And the inning is over. Two out single for Butler. No runs for the Royals in the first. Second inning on a home run from Jermaine Dye. And speaking of home runs, a gentleman who hit quite a bit with the Royals is with Joe Goldberg. 
Guys, John Mayberry out signing autographs in right field last weekend. John Mayberry Jr. homered, first homer. What was that like for you in New York? It was just an overwhelming experience. You know, uh, everybody wants to see their kids excel in what they do, and uh, he did. He had a great night. All right, well, it was incredible. Congratulations. Let's go back up to you guys in the booth. He signed these autographs. Hey, Frank probably wants one. You sign one of those for Frank? For Frank, <laughs> uh, me, Ares, you know, Ares, he helped me. Hey, yeah, I'll sign anything for Frank because he played first and second. <laughs> All right, let's go back upstairs to you, Frank. I'm bringing this to you right now. But John's already on my wall, so. <laughs> he played first and second. The Royals real first true power power hitter in franchise history. Well Big John didn't like to catch pop ups and uh, you know every time I, I, I the pop up go up then, then I'd kind of watch him and and if I thought he was under it I'd make him catch it sometimes he'll look at me and say what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as the ball goes up I can hear my name Frank Frank Frank. <laughs> uh, he was a lot of fun to play next to. Big John said, uh, I don't care where you throw the ball, just throw it low. Because <laughs> he can really pick the ball out of the dirt. Soft hands, right? He said, if he gets up on my head, I can't do nothing for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Canerco at first. And now A.J. Pierzynski. Royals swept a two-game series from the White Sox here in early May. That was when the Royals were in the middle of that six-game winning streak, which eventually got the Royals to 18 and 11. But Kierzynski in that series was six for eight. Royals got a victory from Zach Greinke in game one and then won the second game in 11 innings. Coming back from a couple of four run deficits. Through the right side, Canerco is going to hold at second base, doesn't run well, and Guillen has the strong arm, but first and second and nobody out. And we'll look at tonight's You Call It, presented by Sprint. What is the most difficult pitch to hit? A, a fastball in the corners. B, a 12-6 to curveball, so a straight over the top curveball. C, a late-breaking slider. Or D, a diving changeup. Text 432432 and our keyword Royals followed by a space and your selection. What do you think? I'll go with A. I believe that the, I've heard that when the first time I stepped in the game, everybody says the best out pitch in baseball is a well placed fastball. And I'll, I'll stick to that one. 0 oh, and 1 on Brian Anderson. And you? <laughs> Me? You. <laughs> I like that one that's just sitting right there on that batting tee. <laughs> when it counts 2 and 0 oh and 3 and 1, right there. Give it to me, right there. <laughs> As we know, it was managed to say, you served him up a big fat cookie. <laughs> Oh, and two to Anderson. Well, having never really played professional baseball, unless you count part of one short season, I remember the adjustment, biggest adjustment from high school to college was the guys started throwing changeups. Seemed like all fastballs and curveballs in high school. And then all of a sudden, the pitch that looked like a fastball coming out of the pitcher's hand but didn't quite get there it was like, whoa, what is this thing? Banny comes back with a strikeout. So Anderson does not advance the runners. Second strikeout for Banny, one down in the second inning. Well, this is a, this is a really a great curveball right here. I mean, he threw it in a good spot, and he's the mind of the hitter. He's thinking about hitting the ball the other way. See the ball going away, and all of a sudden it dives down on him, and he just says, "Whoop! It's not there anymore. Time to go." And that brings up Chris Getz. Gets runs well, but the White Sox do not have any speed at all on the bases. Gets was 0 for 9 against the Royals. 
in a two game series earlier this month. Good contact hitter. We've seen him leading off for the White Sox. We've seen him bat second for the White Sox. You'd think he'd be a prototypical number two hitter, but now hitting eighth tonight. Coming up this week on Fox Saturday Baseball, Justin Morneau and the Twins take on Evan Longoria and the defending American League champion Rays. Fox Saturday Baseball returns this week at 3 p.m. Central on Fox. One and one on Chris Getz. One and two. Well, you have some guys, Ryan, they don't they don't run very fast, but in certain situations they always end up in the play. But you know, AJ Brzezinski is one of those guys with the Rawls not holding him on. He has that uncanny knack of getting down there and breaking up double play. There's the ground ball, but it's off of Bannister's glove. Don't know if the Royals would have turned a double play anyway with gets his speed, but they get the second out. Canerco to third, Pierzynski to second. What do you think? Chance for a double play? Well, I think anytime you hit a ball up the middle, there's that as an outside chance that Casco could have been able to, to beat Pierzynski to the ball and the outside chance. You know, anytime the ball goes over the mound, you got a chance. Alberto made a real good correction to uh, to the baseball and and just went straight to first base and didn't think about going to second. So I thought that was a real good read on his part. And now Josh Fields, who has struggled this year, hitting just 229. Fields taking over full time at third base this year with Joe Creedy moving on to the Minnesota Twins. Fields was the White Sox first round pick in 04 out of Oklahoma State. One ball, one strike. And strikeouts have not only been an issue for him with two outs and runners in scoring position, but in all situations. He has the sixth most strikeouts in the American League, 48. Behind the fastball, and it's one and two. Now that was an outstanding pitch by Banning right here. This ball just really exploded on the outside corner. And that's why I took A right there, because of that pitch right there. <laughs> Especially when you're looking for B, C, or D, and he gives you A. <laughs> I just love that pitch right there. That was that was a pitcher's pitch all the way. Pounded to deep left field. Back goes to Jesus and Fields hits the top of the wall. That'll drive in two more. So Fields, as they say, going down and getting it, and Chicago has an early three to nothing lead. Yeah, going, this is a this is a slider that stayed up out over play. He really went down and dug it out, but you know the, the fastball he threw previous to that pitch. I mean, it was such an exploding fastball on the outside corner, and Fields was obviously late on that fastball. I would have been tempted to go back out there and see if that was for real or not before I went to the breaking ball. And we've been talking about that all year about the pitcher's tendency sometimes to feel like they have to throw all of their pitches. Now 0 and 1 on Podsednik. He grounded out his first time up. I think with a breaking ball that could have got on the outer half down, it might have been a different story. But I, I always feel like when you beat someone that bad with a fastball, then you got to come back and, and see if it's real or not. Off the plate. Tough play for Vanny. And Butler comes off the bag. Benny does a great job coming down. He feels the ball in good shape, but he just threw too wide at first base. An air charge to Bannister. 
You know, Pasemi runs pretty good. He hit that high chopper like that, so it's going to make everybody speed up a little bit. And that affected advantage throw to first base. Oh, and one to Ramirez. He grounded out. Well, sure, the throw was offline, but I mean, Brian Bannister had hardly any time at all to set his feet, grab the ball, get a good grip on it. I mean, he had to grab it and throw it right away. But the, the degree of difficulty was definitely high on that play. Speed, speed will make make you do those things. Pass Hernandez. It's four to nothing, Chicago. Bannister almost got out of it. Gave up singles to Canerco and Pierzynski, but a strikeout and a ground out. And he was ahead one and two on Josh Fields. But a two run double, an error, and now Ramirez drives in his 21st, and it's a four run lead in the second. Well, right now it's not really the fastball that's getting him in trouble, it's the, it's the slaughter, and he's leaving it out over the plate. And Ramirez got that long swing and, and just caught it down on the barrel of the bat and was able to pull it in the hole. This has not been a good matchup for Bannister in his career. It's his first start this year against Chicago. The tenth of his career. He's only had five decisions, two and three, but his ERA against Chicago, and it'll go up. But coming in tonight, 7.66. Now Jermaine Dye, who homered to center field in the first inning. Olivo has to dig that one out of the dirt. Well, this is back in the first inning right here. He just leaves a, a cutter right out over the middle of the plate, and that's like a golf shot right there, straight away center field. Jermaine batting with Podsednik at second, Ramirez at first. Podsednik back in plenty of time. That home run from Die reminded me of the home runs that he hit when he was with the Royals and the approach from then batting coach Lamar Johnson, which really got him going and telling Jermaine, don't try and hit home runs. Try and hit doubles, and sometimes if you hit a double just right, it'll sail and become a home run. Well, Lamar had a real good, simple approach to hitting, and he, he tried to he tried to keep it real simple. And 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 uh, I think hitters learn faster when you're not too technical, and you just give them one goal and, and let them stick with it, and and see how it comes out. Well, some Royals had some. Career years when he was here. Mike Sweeney got his career going. Jermaine died. Johnny Damon took his game to another level. Full count on Jermaine, and with two outs, the runners will be going. Joe Randa, Carlos Beltran's first few years in the major leagues with Lamar Johnson as batting coach. Sednick and Ramirez are running and die fouls it away. You'll find Ryan a lot of hitting coaches a lot of times they, they they're saying the same things when they say keep the ball in the in the middle of the field from alley to alley straight away. It just but just getting that good balance in the in, the, in your stance and making sure that you're in a good position to do that is it, pretty key a lot of times. Lamar used to play what he used to call a long tee. You know he would just get buckets of balls and put two guys together and let them drive the ball. Speaking of driving the ball, Jermaine almost knocked the foul pole over. And he just set up drive the ball to different sections of the field. Just like you, it's like on a tee, on the tee at first, and then they do soft toss. And he just really liked that drill. And, and so guys can actually see where the ball was going. 
But your main swing looks so level and so quick right now. Trying to get an out on the bases. White Sox have won three straight series, taking two out of three from Pittsburgh, two out of three from Minnesota, and they just took two out of three from the Angels in Anaheim. And they, like the Royals, had an off day yesterday. Guy grounds it to deep third. Tian, with one foot on the outfield grass, is right on the money to Butler. But the White Sox get three. Fields drives in two. Ramirez drives one home. First three in the second against Brian Bannister. Mike Jacobs, Mark Tian, Alberto Cayaspo to face Clayton Richard in the second. Richard did not have a good start when he was initially moved into the rotation, but he has pitched very well in his last two. He's only given up one earned run in his last 14 innings. One and one on Jacobs. Who was just one for ten against the Tigers. Adding at 257. Leading the Royals with those nine home runs. Here's tonight's league leaders brought to you by your Kansas City area Toyota dealers. And those nine home runs, third best in the American League for players with a new team. Mark to share it. Man, his, his season turned around in May when Alex Rodriguez came back. And Russell Branion, who has been with several teams, hoping that he could be a little bit more consistent making contact with his great power. 11 home runs with the Mariners, and then Mike Jacobs with nine. Strikes out. Second for Clayton Richard, one down in the second inning. Go back to 1985. We take a look at our Cabot Woodstein legendary performances on this date. Danny Jackson wins. Dan Quisenberry with a save. George Brett hits a home run. And the Royals tie the Angels for first place. Royals finished pretty strong that year, if I recall. Well, we, we hit a little bump in the road there, and we made that trade with the Cardinals to get Lonnie Smith, and when he came over. Seemed like things just sort of started moving. He's a very, he was a very aggressive player. Stole bases, broke up double plays, and and when he came over, started stealing bases. Willie got jump started again, and I think everything started to fall in place. 
Lonnie Smith had a stretch in his career where it seemed like everywhere he went, a championship followed, didn't it? Oh, it was unbelievable. <laughs> well, he doesn't have enough finger for his rings. <laughs> but he was a hard-nosed player, though. I mean, he could break up double play with the best of them. I mean, he was actually dangerous when he went to break up double plays. They put him and George and Hal McRae together. And no, I mean, I, I, they would just... They would just say, Frank, you just turn your double play. We don't want to take you out because we don't want our guys to get hurt. <laughs> T and four hits a home run against the Tigers. Also had a costly error in the game on Wednesday afternoon. It's kind of a tough day when you feel like you took a step forward on offense. Mark had been slumping a bit, had a good day at the plate on Wednesday, but then again had that air at third base. Still three and two. Yeah, that's one of the hardest things about playing every day is that you got to maintain consistency not only offensively but defensively. And and you really always want to keep it defensively more than offensively because you know that you can create a bigger problem for your team by letting in more runs than you drive in, which is usually the case. To left center, so a nice inside out swing, and the Royals have a base runner with one out in the second inning. Second hit against Clayton Richard. Well, a lot of times as hitters, you want to get out front and you want to hit the ball before it gets there, but uh, Mark really hit that ball about the trademark, and you can get a good look at it right here. And he just let the ball get in on him a little deeper, and you can get a lot of hits that way rather than trying to get out too fast. And now you're more susceptible to the fastball and break them all away. And now Kiaspo. Alberto three out of ten against Detroit. Alberto hitting a little better than. 150 points better on this side of the plate. Which is a little odd because it seems like when switch hitters make the move and then after a few years they have so many more at bats from the left side than the right side it seems like their natural side is the one that suffers. Well that's true. I think he's facing left handers and he does a good job going the other way with the left handers fastball and and I think that's what helps him just serve the ball out in the right center field. That, to me, he swings a lot harder left-handed than he does right-handed. A little bit more, little bit more uh, body control and back control when he's batting right-handed. Second toughest in the American League to strike out. And Richard comes inside at 94 miles an hour, two and two. Well, he will pitch in off the plate, and I think that's a good thing because he, he really opens up, open the plate up for himself, but he's got that good hard slider that he can throw down, and that, that's pitch to get down under your bat right there. Hit hard, but right to Ramirez, and the White Sox turn it into a double play. Two scoreless innings for Clayton Richard. White Sox lead 4-0.
or visit kia.com. And by AT&T, switch to the nation's fastest 3G network. AT&T, your world delivered. Jim Tomey leads off in the third inning, four to nothing White Sox. Bannister struck him out in the first, jumps ahead 0 and 1. Tonight's Firestone leaderboard, active career home run leaders. Ken Griffey Jr. at 616, Alex Rodriguez second, and the man standing up there now, Jim Tomey at 549. Three pitches, one away. Bandy did a real good job setting this cutter up. He threw a slider down underneath uh, Jim Tomey's swing, and then he came back with a backdoor cutter on the outside corner. So that's a great job of pitching to Jim Tomey right there. Canerco singled and he along with Pierzynski scoring on Josh Fields two run double in the second inning. One and one. Now Banny's cutter is a good one and it's working for him this year but he's throwing it so often now. And there's that old belief about you know either use it or lose it is he going to have to every now and then mix in some four seam fastballs to make sure he doesn't lose that pitch or at least lose the velocity that he normally has on that pitch and, and losing the command on it also you got to you got to move it in and off outside inside he needs, he needs to clear his lane for himself by pitching a little more aggressively inside and that'll make his other pitches a little bit better but the sliders hurt him today and a cutter out over the plates hurt him so he just needs to get out of the middle of the plate and get back on the corner. 92 with that pitch outside. Because I mean it's it's a good cutter but it's not quite Mariana Rivera's cutter where you know it's coming and you still can't hit it. I mean if these guys start to know that it's coming all the time. As Canerco rolls out to Hernandez. Two down in the third inning. Well it, you know the thing about the cutter Ryan is it's a velocity you know if Mario Ron Rivera's uh, would probably be somewhere in uh, as we see Clayton Richards at 96 miles per hour and Brian Bannister at 92. So Clayton Richards obviously has the advantage in miles per hour. Uh, but uh, you, you really you really have to get back to moving the ball in and out. And I just don't see uh, Banning really attacking inside off the plate to set the cutter up at 86 87 miles an hour for Rivera's is probably 88 89 miles an hour and it gets in there a lot faster. Krasinski to shallow left to Jesus comes up slides on his knees and makes the play. Bannister retires the White Sox in order for the first time tonight.
Mike O'Neill legacy seat tonight as Colleen Fudry has been an active member of the Eastern Jackson County community since moving there nearly 35 years ago. She was a member of the Independence Missouri JC Wives and has belonged to Junior Service League. She has also worked closely with Hope House, a shelter for domestic abuse victims. So welcome, Colleen. Hope you're enjoying the game. Miguel Olivo, a bullet to the second baseman, gets. The Royals have lost two base hits in that part of the field tonight. Gets made a great diving play on Willie Bloomquist's line drive in the bottom of the first. And that brings up Luis Hernandez. Hernandez, two out of nine with an RBI. His RBI was a base hit off of Joel Zamaya on Wednesday. Turned around a 99 mile an hour fastball. Gets again on a well hit ball. Two down in the bottom of the third inning. Back to you call it presented by Sprint. We asked you the most difficult pitch to hit close tonight. A 39% going with a late breaking slider. Could be a result of watching Zach's late breaking slider this year and how many strikeouts he's gotten from that. Otherwise, it's pretty close. 12 to 6 curveball followed by a diving changeup and a fastball on the corner. Keep voting. Oh, and one to Bloomquist. Zach will start on Sunday afternoon. Gil Mesh goes tomorrow. And Zach has a chance to tie Brett Saberhagen for the best start in Royals history before the month of June. Saberhagen had a year where he went nine and one. Right now, Zach is eight and one. And two of those wins against the White Sox. Was fighting to stay alive. The defensive play of the game so far was Chris Getz diving on a bullet from Bloomquist in the first inning. Still 0 and 2. And this is a really an outstanding play right here. But Willie slices the ball, and the ball is actually going away from Chris Getz, and he just stayed with it. And that's that's a total reaction play. Watching the swing of the hitter and staying with the ball. And that, that, that ball was actually by him when he caught it. A nasty little face plant on the grass after making that catch. That's better than on the turf. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't hurt as bad when you catch the ball, right? Not at, not, not at all. <laughs> you know, Willie, at least tonight, taking over completely for Coco Chris. Leading off and playing in center field. That is a nasty pitch. Three strikeouts for Clayton Richard and three scoreless innings.
tonight's AMCO AAMCO Clutch Play of the Week. Zach Grinke winning his eighth, fifth complete game on Tuesday, beating the Tigers 6-1. to one. one run, six hits, no walks, eight strikeouts. And he will pitch again in this series on Sunday. As Anderson hits it past Tian into the left field corner, Anderson runs well. De Jesus went sliding into the corner to make sure it didn't get by him. It's a leadoff double for Brian Anderson. He's one for two. Again, this is another breaking ball, right? It's right out over the plate and right inside the bag. David did an outstanding job here. This ball gets by him. It's trouble. You know, it gets underneath that, that uh, padding there and goes down in that corner. Maybe David wasn't left handed. Might have been a very difficult play for, for a right handed thrower. And now Getz, who grounded to second, pick off second base, and Bannister didn't think he had a play, so didn't throw. But Getz grounded out to second his first time, and he will take that here with Anderson at second base and nobody out. Back to Bannister, and the Royals are going to have Anderson in a rundown. Anderson did stay in long enough for Chris Getz to get to second base, and that keeps Anderson out of Ozzie Guillen's doghouse. Well, you, get, you just really switched places with him right there, but the, the threat, what made that play is Getz just kept, kept running right out of the box. He never did slow down uh, going around first base. So one six five on the fielder's choice. So really the only thing that could have changed on that play Ryan was once the ball went to Hernandez if he gave it up right away to Martin and got everything coming back to first. There was a possibility of throwing the ball to second to get gets and they're still having to run down between third and, and second base. And now fields into right center. Yan runs it down gets will tag and advance to third. So two outs fields is one for two but he has the big hit in the game tonight. With two on two out and two strikes hit a two run double to make it three to nothing and now it's four nothing. Three game series of the White Sox continues tomorrow at 610 Gil Mesh against Mark Burley. Coverage begins at 530 with Royals live. And the final game at 110 on Sunday. And tomorrow night's game will be in HD. Scott Pudsednik, it seems, in his last two at bats, almost like a little Ichiro in him, kind of shuffling his feet towards the pitcher as the pitch comes in. Want well, to take advantage of his speed and just want to tap the ball. He's not really trying to do a lot as far as driving the ball. Yeah, a little, little shuffle step towards the mound, or at least towards the front end of the box. A lot of times the guys when they can't stay on their backside and wait for the ball to get there they'll they'll take a little shuffle step a sort of a second uh, uh, trigger to, to hit with and so once he lands on his back foot night now, now he's loaded again and that that's what that's well some hitters will do that. But very few I mean you want to have your feet underneath you right you don't want your feet moving all over the place. Well his feet are really actually underneath him when he swings basically he always is just taking a little step up now he's still in the same spot. But it, but he, nothing changes. It just gives it. It's just a secondary uh, position you put with your feet to just give you give you better balance. That's better to play as a hitter. Scoreless fourth inning for Brian Bannister.
Sox. Tomorrow's a 6-10 game, and the first 20,000 fans are going to get this replica Monarchs jersey from Pepsi. Gates are going to open at 3 o'clock, so come out early. Check out the new outfield experience if you haven't been to Kauffman Stadium. New Kauffman Stadium this year. And as part of the salute to the Negro Leagues tomorrow, the Royals and the White Sox will be wearing vintage Negro League uniforms. So come on out tomorrow at 6-10. DeJesus struck out first time against Clayton Richard, and now he's down 0-2. Two hits for the Royals. Two out single from Butler in the first. A one out single from Tian in the second. Richard has only faced one over the minimum. Got him with a breaking ball, four strikeouts. Billy Butler is singled back in the first. Well, the White Sox, like the Royals, have been doing it more so far with pitching than they have hitting. But White Sox, it's still a surprise to me to look at them offensively. They are second from the bottom in team batting average, second from the bottom in runs scored. They're sixth in the league in team ERA, and that's what has them four games under 500. Starting to put things back together recently. The White Sox started the year at 12 and 10 going into the month of May, but then they had a stretch where they went 3 and 12, including two losses against the Royals. And as we mentioned earlier, now they've won three straight series. Jermaine Dye, who knows this ballpark well, runs it down in foul ground and retires Billy Butler. I think a lot of the up and down of the team in the center as we watch Jermaine Dye make this play near the right field wall is that there's a lot of parity, more, more, the thinking is that there's more parity in the central division uh, than. At any other time, and that's why you see teams go on a good little streak and they go on a bad little streak, and they but no team yet has just put it together and maintained it over a long period of time. And, and I talked to Jose again about this before the game. I said, I said, What do you think is the difference in this in, in the division? He says, Well, he thinks all the teams are pretty comparable, but he thinks the main thing that's going to separate the teams is the teams that do the fundamental things right. Driven to deep right field and Jermaine to the track. Makes the catch. Boils down in order, and now Richard has retired seven straight. The Royals have had some problems 
scoring runs. But tonight, I think it has a lot more to do with the way Clayton Richard is pitching. Well, Ryan, he's doing a great job. He's really eliminated the runs of two hits, and he's throwing the fastball anywhere from 93 to 96, along with his slider, curveball, change. He's got, he even got a split finger, so he's got a good mixture of pitches that he's uh, being very effective with to this point in the game. So for Clayton Richard now, he's allowed one earned run in his last 17 innings. Alexi Ramirez into right. Guillen comes up a few strides. Ramirez one for three with an RBI tonight. A couple of efficient innings for Bannister in the third and the fourth, and that's important as we look at his James B. Nutter pitch count tonight. 68 total. But he was at 48 pitches after two innings. The Royals are in a stretch of games now where they have some off days. After this three game series an off day on Monday and the Royals go on the road they'll play six games and then another off day. And with that being said Trey Hillman will never argue with a starting pitcher going seven or eight innings. <laughs> Jermaine Dye homered to straightaway center field in the first inning, his 13th of the year, 311th of his career. Also grounded out. One ball, two strikes. Two and two. Well, this is kind of. Against the form chart for Bannister tonight, he had three straight starts where he gave up next to nothing in the first five innings, but then got into trouble in the sixth. And tonight, giving up four runs in the first two innings, but now kind of hitting his stride in the last two. Well, that's true, and I, I think right now he's doing a better job of getting the cut on the outside corner, fastball on the outside corner, but still, I think he really hasn't established anything inside to, to keep the hitters off that pitch, and that's why when he get the two strikes, they're able to go out there and foul those balls off and and wait for you to make another mistake in, in, in the middle of the plate. So I think for these big hitters like Canarco, Jermaine and Tommy, I think he's got to throw the ball inside to get those guys off those balls out over the plate. So walk to die with one out. That's Danny's first walk tonight. Jim Tommy coming up. Banny has struck him out twice. Here's the strikeout in the third inning. Well, this is one of his best best hitters he'd be faced tonight. He got the fastball on the outside corner, and then he came down with a slider down underneath his swing. And this is when he just came back with a backdoor cutter right on the outside corner. So that was a very effective at, uh, pitching duel against, against Jim, Jim Tome, if you want to call it a duel. And he breaks his bat. It's over Hernandez. Didn't hit it very hard. So Willie has a ways to come in to get it and die will go first to third. So Tommy one for three and. White Sox again putting a rally together. With Paul Canerco coming up. Well, one thing you didn't want to do in, in the middle of this order is walk anyone to uh, bring someone up with a possibility of hitting a hitting a two run homer. But here they got a first and third situation. You know preceded by a walk. After a walk, sorry. And now Canerco, who is a double play candidate, grounded into four so far this year. Tonight, a single and a run scored in the second, a ground out to short in the third. Die homered in the first, Fields hit a two run double in the second, and then later in the inning, Alexi Ramirez driving in a run with a single. Canerco, just like Jermaine Dye, reached a milestone this year with his 300th career home run, and that's hit hard to left. A lot of top spin. De Jesus makes the play. Dye will tag and score to make it five to nothing. Canerco has 32 RBIs, so the walk turns into a run.
So two down to A.J. Pierzynski, and for the second time tonight, A.J. or rather Sidney Ponson is warming up in the Royals bullpen. You know, right? I don't want to make a big deal about uh, Brian Bannister not pitching inside, but that pitch to Kernerko was away, and because it, everything's away, he was able to go out there and hook it back to left field, you know, for for a sack fly. So. If you're not going, if you're going to pitch in that one quadrant all night, then you got to make some real quality pitches to survive there. I'm trying to think of one guy tonight that's been forced to move his feet. Uh, I, I really can't uh, think of any hitter that's gone up there where he's, he's worked in back and forth, inside, outside, to set up his uh, cutter, set up his slider on the outside corner. Behind Carol Baines, former great White Sox outfielder and designated hitter. At number three, was retired by the White Sox when Harold Baines moved on to the Baltimore Orioles, but then was unretired when Harold joined the coaching staff. Well, one thing about Harold, the, the one thing that made him at the age when he hurt his arm, he had a great throwing arm before he hurt it. Still one and two. 2,830 career hits for Harold Beans. <laughs> so you want a baseball, huh? <laughs> Sox done in the fifth, but they add a fifth run. The right taste that never fills you up. The difference is drinkability. And by Colorado Tourism, plan your summer vacation at Colorado.com. Ryan Lefevre with Frank White and Joel Goldberg on a nice warm night in Kansas City. But a tough night so far for the Royals, down five to nothing. And Paul Canerka with his hands out at his sides. That that can be confusing there. You can't tell. Was he calling it off or did he not see the ball? Well, normally when he's out to the sides, it means he doesn't see the ball. So that. But maybe that's his way of saying I got it. <laughs> it's not quite that time of night where you can lose the ball in the twilight. So Clayton Richard has retired eight in a row. The last man to reach was Tian, who takes ball one. Single with one out in the second inning, but then Richard got Kiaspo to ground into a double play. Tian is two for two. Oh, 
Well, it's starting to feel like summer. And it's time to get a Royals beach towel from High V. Doc Carruthers, our stage manager, is going to demonstrate. First 20,000 fans are going to get this great summer accessory. It first begins as a kind of like a beach bag. And then you open it up and it becomes a beach towel. That's coming up on June the 13th against the Cincinnati Reds. Now that is an original promotion. I haven't seen that one before. I like that. The, the key is can you ever get it back to being a bag? <laughs> Kiaspo into left center. Tian stops at second base. And for the first time tonight, the Royals have more than one base runner in an inning. Kiaspo one for two. Yeah, we say he's got a nice, uh, shorter, compact swing right handed, and he does a good job getting inside of this, this pitch and hitting the line drive over shortstop. So, two on, one out for former White Sox catcher Miguel Olivo. Originally from the A's organization, but made it to the big leagues with Chicago. Takes a fastball for strike one and became the 83rd player in Major League history to home hit a home run in his first Major League at bat with the White Sox back in 02, hit it off of Andy Pettit to third. Fields. Out at second, gets to Canerco, and that's the second double play for the White Sox tonight. End of five, five nothing Chicago. And it's time to take a look at tonight's Coors Light freeze cam. And we go back to the bottom of the first inning. And Willie Bloomquist leading off. Thought he had a base hit into right field until Chris Getz came out of nowhere, made the catch, face plant onto the grass. And Getz has had a good night at second tonight. Coors Light freeze cam brought to you by Frostbrew Coors Light, the world's most refreshing beer. Ryan Anderson begins the sixth inning with a solid base hit to center. Bloomquist cuts it off. Anderson trying to turn it into a double, and he will. Second double the night for Brian Anderson. He's two for three. Well, this is a, this is another slaughter run that really stayed over the plate, and uh, Vanix keeps going in the same area. And the White Sox hitters are going out there. Here, Bloomquist is going to right center field, has to do a 360, and he reads that, and he knows there's got to be a good throw to throw him out at second base. Getz trying to advance him, fouls it away. 
Grounded out twice. But we told you at the beginning tonight that the Royals have played very well against the White Sox. I mean, even the game they lost on opening day really has just one bad pitch. The Royals four and one against Chicago so far. And a key, a big key for the Royals, keeping the ball in the ballpark against the White Sox. Three home runs in those first five games for Chicago. Only nine extra base hits, so fewer than two extra base hits per game. Now Getz goes into left center field. That'll score Anderson. And Chicago leads six to nothing. But tonight, completely different story. The White Sox have four extra base hits and a home run. It seems like we've seen this game before against Chicago. Well, you really have to pitch down to these guys, and you, you can't walk guys before the big guys come up and give them an opportunity to put two run homers on the board. Hits. Hey, you can watch the Royals and Rays game coming up on Tuesday when the Royals are on the road at the KC Live area in the Power and Light District. Admission is free. All ages are welcome. And everyone has a chance to win great prizes. Free game starts at 5 o'clock, so head out to the Power and Light District for a fun time with Slugger and Royals fans coming up on Tuesday. So Sidney Ponson. Comes on a run home in this inning. And Chris gets it first. Nobody out facing Josh Fields. Late on the fastball, it's 0 1. Fields took a similar swing at a similar pitch back in the second inning. Swung through a fastball that was on the outside part of the plate, appeared to be late. On the pitch. That got Bannister ahead one and two, and then Danny came back with a curveball that it was down, but is out over the plate, and Fields hit a two run double. That was with two outs and two strikes. Uh, Ponton has the ability to use that that two seamer and try to catch the outside corner to right hander, so we'll see if he'll go that direction against Fields. 93 with a sinker. Josh Fields facing Sidney Ponson for the first time. Through the right side, and Chris Getz will easily go first to third. So runners at the corners, nobody out. But Josh Fields hitting 229 coming in tonight with two hits. 
But again, Ryan, that was really too easy right there. Every pitch is on the outside part of the plate, and and the, and the raw pitchers tonight have really just carried the White Sox hitters right out there. So he hit that ball pretty much like he was looking for. And so they're really going to have to start coming in off the plate to establish that pitch away and maybe try to finish them. White Sox hit us off hard inside with the fastball. Well, nobody has moved their feet yet except for Podsednik, but that is his own doing. <laughs> well, well Ponson likes to bring that, fat, that uh, two seamer inside the lefties and try to catch the inside corner and throws it kind of at the waist or just above the knees and, and get him to move back and give up on it. Up the middle, past Kiaspo, and Kiaspo and Hernandez collide. So we've gone from first to third to first and third to first and third in this inning. It's seven to nothing Chicago. On Sednik is first hit and his sixth RBI of the year. Well, he got his ground ball, which is what he was looking for, but with the infield, not just not all the way in, but in quite a bit. What we call the three depth on the infield. He was able to get that ball over the bag into center field. Still nobody out. And that closes the book on Brian Bannister. And Ramirez into center field. It's eight to nothing. Podsednik is going to go first to third. Challenge Bloomquist. And he's in safely. So Alexi Ramirez drives in his second of the game. And the first five have reached in the Chicago half of the sixth inning. And after three straight hits given up by Ponson, Bob McClure out to the mound. Well, this. Th this again is that that uh, two seamer that he tried to catch the outside corner, but Ramirez again, just like Fields, went right out there and went right with it and got him a, got himself a base hit. We talked about those two seamers, Ryan. The ones that sort of slide across the plate in the strike zone; those are the ones that get hit on a regular basis. When Ponzone's really on, his his two seamer flips over, and when it flips over, guys top it and hit a lot of high hoppers and a lot of weak ground balls on the infield. And now you wonder when it's eight to nothing in the sixth inning. I mean, is now a good time to start pitching inside, or does this look like a frustrated pitching staff if you start moving feet at this stage of the game? Well, I think you're pitching inside for effect. You're not really pitching inside to knock a hitter down. You just want him to kind of move back a little bit and just pitch him inside to let him know you will come inside. But like you say, uh, sometimes, you know, when the horse is out of the barn, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was too late to lock the door. I've got a chunk of Ed Rapuano. He's the crew chief of this umpiring crew. That is bell rung. Where are you, Ed? What'd you have for breakfast? <laughs> I know I wouldn't want to get hit like that <laughs> because of what kind of armor I've got on. Like this this. I mean that ball just traveled a short distance, goes right off on the side of Miguel Olivo, and he comes right up and catches him. Miguel Olivo going out to talk to Ponson. I don't think he had anything to say to Sydney, just doing that in respect to the home plate umpire and give him a few more moments to pull it together. Yeah, umpires do that too when when catchers get hit with foul balls uh, in certain places. <laughs> They'll just go out and brush off the plate, walk out to the mound, do some things to get, give them a chance. So they, they kind of know that routine. So only certain places, huh? There, there are other parts where you get hit and, and it's not worth going out and wiping down the plate? No, it's just certain places. Okay. There's more than one place now. No? <laughs> That's a that direct hit to the face mask. And, off the and others. Off the wrist. <laughs> You know, off the shoulder. Blocked by Olivo, but Ramirez is going to move up to second base. The White Sox still playing hard with an eight run lead and nobody out in the sixth inning. Well, 
Well, this looks like a little try to throw a little curveball or slotted right here that really held on to it way too long. Three balls, two strikes. The first five have reached. Seven of the eight runs charged to Brian Bannister, five innings. And then here in the six, he gave up the double to Anderson, a single to Getz, and then Ponson has come in and given up three straight singles. The wild pitch just cost the Royals a double play. Podsednik scores to make it nine to nothing. Ramirez holds at second. One away. Jermaine Dye with his second RBI of the game is 33rd of the year. Tonight's copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the Kansas City Royals. May not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Kansas City Royals Baseball Corporation. One and to Tommy. Tommy struck out his first two times against Bannister and then singled in the fifth. Pretty good swing, one and one. Now, I was talking to a member of the White Sox before the game tonight. And Hasn't been that long since we've seen the White Sox, but you know their fortunes have really changed since we saw them last. And I said, "What do I need to know about the White Sox?" And he said, "It's just been a, a funny thing. When they win, they play really well, and when they lose, they play really bad. I mean, there's just no, you know, a loss where you know you, you played a good game, you just happened to get beat that night. And I was thinking, you know, that's kind of the way it's been going for the Royals lately. And the Royals." Losing on Wednesday 8 to 3. They lost 13 to 1 on Monday. They were shut out in consecutive games last weekend in St. Louis. Tommy takes a one out walk. On the homestand before this one, there was a, a loss to the Cleveland Indians 8 to 3. And then the Royals wins. Sunday in St. Louis, well played game. Brian Bannister was pitching, winning three to two. Willie Bloomquist with a hustling double, setting up the Mike Jacobs pinch hit RBI single, and then Zach Greinke and company in the game on Tuesday, winning six to one. And you know, it sounds like what is ailing the White Sox at the moment. It's the same for the Royals. Well, Ryan, I think fans want to see runs uh, just as much as they want to see pitching. I think the if 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 the Royals were losing those games nine to seven. Seven to five, you know, and I think that fans like to see some action on the field. So when your team is not hitting, regardless of how well the pitching is, you really look flat. It's like you're just not playing very good baseball. But if you're competing on the run board, then the fans can see some some glimmer of light that hey, these guys can score some runs. They're going to be exciting to watch, and and they're, they're they're ready to. It's ready for us to go out and watch them play and look for that offense on a regular basis. But you have to score runs to keep the fans interested. Case in point, and we've referred to this already, and the Royals in 1999 set a franchise record for runs scored, but they lost 97 games. It was an exciting team to watch. All those blown saves killed the Royals, but that was about the most exciting 97 loss team you're ever going to see because they were scoring runs. Yeah, you have to score runs. Still 0 2 on Canerco. He has driven in a run tonight. Well, it's, it's kind of like you got to get the fans a reason to get up out of their seat and, and get up, you know, and cheer and root and, and you know, a well pitched game kind of keeps them locked into their seat. They don't get up very often, but you score five, six, seven runs and they're up a lot. And they, they really, they really enjoy that type of baseball.
One and two on Canerco. Kind of a half swing. And that's foul off the right field line. Canerco, one of those guys who can hit for power, and he will strike out from time to time, but also will shorten his swing with two strikes, try to become more of a high average hitter than a power hitter. Well, he's, all, he's off to a better start this year than last year. Uh, I talked to Greg Walker, their hitting coach, and he was saying that toward the end of the year, uh, you know, Paul was just more or less thinking about the things he couldn't do. You know, like run. Everybody said he couldn't run, couldn't play defense, things like that. And then he said, he looked in the mirror, and he said, "You can hit." And so he said he decided at that point that I'm just going to go out and have some fun, and uh, and see what happens. He's ever since he got that attitude, everything just turned around for him. I think the White Sox surprised David DeJesus by sending Alexi Ramirez to the plate. Canerco with his second RBI. 33rd of the year. Well, a lot of times, uh, you know, players are getting into the mindset of the other team, and a lot of teams in that situation might hold the runner up being such a, a big score on the board. But here you just got to come up and let the ball go. In the top of the sixth inning with only one out. This is game one of three. And with a preview of Royals Live tomorrow, here's Joel. Well, yeah, I figured we'd uh, take a chance to talk about tomorrow because we had a real nice show up at Rivals today with John Mayberry. And tomorrow, Royals general manager Dayton Moore will be joining us up at Rivals. So a chance to talk to him about the season, how things are going. And obviously, lately they haven't been great, but he will also be taking fan questions. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, Boulevard Royals live after the game. Maybe there will be a great comeback. Otherwise, I am here and lady just asked me where to find the ice cream. Now, had she been saying it because she knows I eat a lot of food around the ballpark, I would have understood that, but I think she thought I was an usher. <laughs> I don't know what the microphone means, but I, I said, no. I I said no, I'm just on I'm just on TV. She said, oh. So that was that. So she would have been more impressed if you were an usher. Or just someone that knows where to find the ice cream. <laughs> she may have thought the mic was an ice cream cone. <laughs> uh, Fox Sports Kansas City flavor. <laughs> Back to you. Kyle Farnsworth is facing the ninth White Sox hitter in this inning. Chicago has scored five. Oh, and two on A.J. Pierzynski. And with a huge lead early in the game. This gives Ozzie Gein a chance to rest some of his regulars. So Dwayne Wise, who was just called up when Carlos Quentin went on the disabled list, will run for Canerco. And Pierzynski over Butler and inside the right field line. 
Tomey scores. Wise stops at third. Pierzynski has an RBI double, his second hit. Six runs in the sixth. And the White Sox have batted around, making only one out. Well, this pitch gets in on Pazinski as a hard slide. He breaks his bat in half, but able to get the ball down the line in a good spot. And then again, with the lead being what it is, uh, Coxie at first base, Jeff Cox decided to score one run, but not, not both of the runs. Well, that was nice of him. That's one of those courtesy things that teams do when they, when they, when they way ahead like that. They don't want to really run up the score. Brian Anderson started this inning with a double off of Brian Bannister and came around to score. Two balls, no strikes. Jeff Cox is from the Royals Academy. Yeah. Former undrafted free agent signee of the Royals. But we were all lucky undrafted free agents signed through, signed through tryout camps, though. So I'd say we're pretty lucky. Uh, Jeff was also a second baseman in the, in the Royals Baseball Academy. Now, if I've read my facts correctly, he was fast, right? Yeah, he was a pretty good runner, yeah. He, I mean, he, we, that was one of the things about the academy players, especially the position players. Speed was also one of those things they looked at. Speed, arm strength, and uh, and bat speed and that type of thing. But you didn't really have to be a baseball player to go there. They just wanted good athletes that they thought they could train you in baseball by bringing in different people to show you the different things to do. And then the instructors would drill you in those uh, things uh, once once they left but we, we had one player uh, went to Westport High School here in Kansas City who was a wrestler who got the A ball but that's about as high as he got that never played any amateur baseball. And he would have been one of the guys that you talked about where if you get in a fight with another team you want to take the wrestler out first, right? You don't want him to get too involved. Well, he wasn't—he wasn't a big wrestler. He wasn't—he oh, okay. wasn't, wasn't a heavyweight. <laughs> Those guys are quick, though. <laughs> Jeff Cox also was in the Royals system as a minor league manager and once the Royals' third base coach. Farnsworth gets a strikeout, and now Levo down to second base. I think Pierzynski lost track of the outs. Wise to the plate. And the White Sox are just going to give the Royals a third out of the inning.
Our contestant is Jared Rinker from Independence, Missouri. The Rawls hit a home run this inning. Jared will win $1,500, but if the Rawls hit a grand slam out of the park, Jared will win 25 grand from Sonic and the Kansas City Royals. Wilson Betemy takes over at first base. Dwayne Wise running for Paul Canerco. And then Wise stays in the game and right. So Betemy hits in dive spot. And Wise stays in the number five position. So an 11 run lead for Clayton Richard, who has given up four singles in five innings. Got Luis Hernandez on a sharply hit ground ball to second base in the third inning. Let's see how sharp Clayton Richard is in this sixth inning after sitting around for a long time as the White Sox batted 10 in the top of the sixth. And that happens often. Get out of your rhythm. As well as he has pitched tonight. And as much as pitchers like to have some time in between innings, that time in between innings can get a little long and then take two or three hitters to find the rhythm again. Well, that's true. You think that uh, the eight pitches they get between innings is enough to find, but without a batter standing up there, it makes a big difference. Bloomquist 0 for 2. Sorry, Frank. No, I was going to say, I bet I bet if you ask him, though, would he rather have a long inning and see his team score runs or, would you, or the, uh, the other way? Uh, he'd probably take the runs in a long inning. Yeah, would you like to have your rhythm back, but it's only one to nothing? <laughs> that was the first walk given up by Clayton Richard. One and one to Bloomquist. Hit hard to center, but Anderson comes up for it. One away in the bottom of the sixth. Don't forget that great deal with the Royals and Bob Evans. Every Friday and Sunday home game, a Bob Evans bases loaded four pack. It's the complete package. You'll get four Royals tickets. Each ticket is loaded with $10. You can use it towards anything in the ballpark. And you get all of that for $60. That's over a $100 value. Every Friday and Sunday game at Kauffman Stadium. And don't forget on Sundays to stay after the game for the sprint fun run. Hernandez slide takes Ramirez out enough to prevent another double play. The White Sox have already turned two double plays. De Jesus reaches. He is 0 for 3. Now Billy Butler singled in the first inning, fouled out to Jermaine Dye in the fourth. Driven to deep left field. That'll get the fans out of their seats. Willie Butler with his fourth home run of the year. So this is a Sonic slam inning and Jared Rinker wins $1,500 from Sonic and the Kansas City Royals. Congratulations, Jared. Two and zero on Jose Guillen, who has flied out twice last time up, taking Jermaine Dye to the warning track in right field.
two and one. Let's take another look at the Butler drive to left. Well, it's a 92 mile an hour fastball that played Richard tried to get inside, but left it out over the plate. And Billy Butler really got a good swing on it. There's no doubt when he hits that one, Ryan, that was, that was going to be way back up there. And now Richard has fallen behind Guillen, three and one. Into right field, Dwayne Wise will come up for it. And that's the inning. But the Royals are on the scoreboard. Billy Butler goes deep. 11 to Chicago. been all White Sox 11 to 2 at the end of six innings every hitter in the lineup with a base hit it's the shortest outing for Brian Bannister going five plus giving up seven runs nine hits and the Royals getting on the scoreboard in the bottom of the sixth inning on a two run Billy Butler home run but the Royals still nine behind as Jamie Wright comes on for the top of the seventh inning. So Bannister gives up seven runs in five innings. Sidney Ponson gave up four runs in a third of an inning. And then Farnsworth got the final two outs of the sixth. Chris Getz in the middle of that six run sixth inning. Singled, scored, had an RBI. He's one for three. Does he look like Justin Morneau? <laughs> Pretty close. You mean the, the in the face, in the face or yeah, in the swing. In the face. <laughs> I knew it to me. <laughs> Just reaching out and poking it off the left field line. Still one and two. Don't forget about Royals alumni fans batting practice on July the 11th here at Conference Stadium from 8 a.m. until noon. Ten Royals alumni will be here to work with you. And this year the Royals are Encouraging moms to come out with dad and the kids, 14 and older, $300 per adult, $100 for each kid. Limited to 40 spots. Gets is thrown out by Jamie Wright. So again, that's July the 11th. Call 816 504 816-504-4150. Now Josh Fields. 
been a disappointing year for him with a 229 average coming into the game, but he got the big hit for the White Sox to get them going early. A two out, two strike, two run double against Brian Bannister in the second. And then singled and scored in the sixth. Oh, and two, 93 with some movement. Yeah, he's got some good sink down and in. Like uh, just that's the second uh, straight sinker that went underneath uh, Fields' his bat, and that means Jamie's got some live movement to his to his sinker tonight. Then he goes with a slider down and away. One in the first, three in the second, one in the fifth, six in the sixth for Chicago. Still one and two to Fields. Yeah, the White Sox really uh, are looking away with two strikes, and that was a changeup out over the outside corner. He was able to go out there and get the bat on it. And he threw two real good sinkers down underneath the swing, and you go way off the plate with a slider, and they come back with a changeup out over the plate, and he was right there on it. Broke his bat, but he finds the hole. So a three hit night for Josh Fields, and you know that feels good. Coming in with a 229 average. One on one out in the seventh. Scott Putsednik is hitting for the fifth time. His hit. His run scored and his RBI in that six run sixth inning. Ball one on a sinker. But Sednik is a former high round pick back in 94, 15 years ago. Second round pick of the Texas Rangers. He's had a whole bunch of injuries, never could quite. Get on the path to the big leagues that the Rangers had hoped. Got to the big leagues for the first time with the Mariners. Was still a rookie when he played in the big leagues with the Milwaukee Brewers and had a year where he stole 70 bases. After a couple of years in Milwaukee, went to Chicago in 2005, and he and Tadahito Aguchi really changing. The dynamics of that White Sox batting order, all they did was hit home runs, but gave them a more balanced offense. And they won the World Series that year, beating the Houston Astros. They right, gave them that speed element at the top of the order, and they can play some hit and run, and they, they got a good job at having somebody on base when those middle of the guys came up. And I think every team wants to be like that. Have that one, two guy that can get on and have your three, four, five guys in a position always driving runs. Doing his little foot shuffle, grounds it to Tian, and Podsednik still runs very well. No chance for a double play. Royals get the lead runner, Josh Fields, for the second out. Well, Mark does, does a good job giving the ball to Cass, but that's probably a ball that he probably just should have held on to and not tried to turn it, knowing the speed of Podsednik. And not really getting his body turned so he can make a good throw and, and get his hips clear and go down the line to uh, to Billy at first base. Now Lexi Ramirez who fouls one off of his foot. You now Greg Walker said about him and toward the end of last year he felt the league had really started just not throwing strikes and he was chasing a lot of bad balls and. And really just came right into this season doing the same thing. And whether it be fastballs or breaking balls, he was just a free swinger trying to hit everything. And he said lately he's been doing a little bit better job. And they noticed that he had a, he was wrapping his bat a little bit further than he was. And they went back and looked at film and, and, and let him see it. And now he's starting to do a little bit better job of being 
uh, getting better pitches to hit. He was benched recently for a couple of games. Not necessarily as punishment, but Ozzie Guillen wanted him to just watch the game from a different angle. And Ramirez picks up his third hit of the night. 16 hits for the White Sox, and we're in the seventh inning. But just take a couple of games, no pressure, just watch the game, watch some other hitters take some at bats. And he really started to swing the bat well after taking a two game break. Well, he said he was just really too full conscious and he was trying to get out in front and hit everything and, and really wasn't waiting for the uh, pitch to get there. He was just way out in front of the breaking ball and a little slow for the fastball. But tonight, you know, it hit the hit the left, hit the center, and hit the right. You know, that's that spread it out pretty good. Left side, Tian with the force at second base, and that's the inning. White Sox strand two in the seventh. They lead by nine. Eleven to two, Chicago. Other games brought to you by Panera Bread. Texas in front of Oakland. Rangers in front by three in the West. That's game one of a doubleheader, or game two of the doubleheader. Eighteen and eight in the month of May for the Texas Rangers. Baltimore has won its fifth in a row. Luke Scott with five home runs in his last three games, just coming off the DL. New York in front of Cleveland. The Indians. Have won four in a row. Yankees a half game back of Boston in the East, and Toronto finally snaps that nine game losing streak. They had gone from three or four game lead in the East to two games back. Tampa Bay in front of Minnesota, they have lost five in a row. So they've had a tough time getting it going early this year after going to the World Series. And then Seattle and Los Angeles with the Angels three games back of the Rangers in the West. Jacob strikes out on four pitches. He is 0 for 3 tonight. Five strikeouts for Clayton Richard. But Light presents what's on tap tomorrow night. And Sunday against the White Sox in a long road trip, the first long road trip for the Royals. In 10 days, they'll be going to Tampa Bay, Toronto, and then Cleveland. And a couple of teams at the beginning of that trip that can be very difficult to play in their house. And when I say in their house, I mean in their house, as in inside Tropicana Field, and depending on the weather, inside Rogers Center in Toronto. One and two on Tian. 
Maybe there'd be a chance in Toronto where they open a the roof and give you that outside feeling. It's a nice option to have though. The weather isn't what you want. Close that roof. One thing you know when you go to Tampa Bay and Toronto, you are going to play no matter what. You're definitely going to play. Although, remember that year? Were you on the coaching staff that year when the roof collided, the two panels collided and started to fall apart? <laughs> Game was postponed. Tian retired for the first time tonight by Richard, who has struck out six. Two down in the seventh inning. Well, if he lost the rhythm in the sixth, he's found it in the seventh. He's really sharp with his breaking ball to the outside to the, to the left handers with the breaking ball. And then he also uh, did a, what we call a, a backdoor breaking ball at Tian where he threw it at him and caught the inside corner. Ball one on Kayaspo, who is singled and grounded into a double play. And that's hit hard into left center. On Sednik, cuts it off quickly. Kayaspo wants a double. And he is going to be safe. The ball is in and out of Getz's glove. Two hit game for Alberto Kayaspo. He picks on a slider right here and he gets a good part of the bat on and hits it in the left center field. But, you know, being down by nine runs, you got to really make sure you can get into second base easily. Here, uh, Pasetna gets a great, great throw away and Getz wasn't able to, to hold on to the ball, but that, that's really too close to play uh, at this stage of the game. Olivo is lined to second, grounded into a double play. Clayton Richards first start of the year after Jose Contreras was sent down was on May the 12th. He gave up four runs in three and a third innings to the Indians. 0 and 2 on Olivo. But since then. He has allowed. Three earned runs. In his last 19 and two thirds innings. And that's a three pitch strikeout. So Richard strikes out the side. He has fanned seven tonight. Series against a team in the division 11 to 2 to the eighth inning coming up after the game it's Boulevard Royals live with Joel Goldberg and Jamie Quirk from Rivals Sports Bar in right field interviews from the field and then highlights and analysis brought to you by Boulevard Brewing Company Kansas City's beer Ron Mayhay is the fifth Royals pitcher tonight. 
White Sox with seven of their runs against Brian Bannister in five innings, and they scored four against Ponson in a third of an inning. Two thirds scoreless for Farnsworth, and a scoreless inning for Wright. And now Mehe. This is Jason Nix pinch hitting for Jim Tomey. Pretty good swing at the first pitch from Mayhe, but lines out to left. Routine play for DeJesus, but earlier in the game made a fine defensive play brought to you by the Home Depot doing more on defense. But David did a great job here coming in and getting his glove down underneath that little soft liner and made it made a really excellent play there. Dwayne Wise is a pinch runner for Paul Canerco back in the sixth inning stayed the in the game in right so he bats for the first time. Won the center field job in spring training it was between. Wise Brian Anderson and Jerry Owens. And he hits it hard David was playing shallow and makes the play. But then Dwayne Wise. Had a rough opening series against the Royals. He was 0 for 10 with four strikeouts and get a couple of bunts down and was booed rather hard by the White Sox fans. The Royals have retired the White Sox in order once tonight. That was back in the third inning. Brian Bannister getting Tommy Canerco and Pierzynski the Four, five, and six hitters, and now Mayhe trying to do the same against the four, five, and six here in the eighth. Two hits for Pierzynski with a run scored and an RBI. Not this time. Three hit game for A.J. Pierzynski at Kauffman Stadium this year. Pierzynski. Is nine out of thirteen. So one on, two out. You can shop the largest online selection of Royals gear at the official online pro shop. Open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's the best source for Royals caps, T-shirts, jerseys, and more. Royals.com pro shop. Two doubles, a run scored for Brian Anderson tonight. It's a painful game for the Royals, but what makes it even more painful is that the two best crowds on this homestand have come in. A 13 to 1 loss on Monday to Detroit, and the Royals are down 11 to 2 in the eighth inning tonight. Well, typically, your Friday night crowds with the fireworks and, and Buck Night and so forth, and your Saturday night crowds are usually the best during the week, and it would be always great to win when you got more people in the stands. But Get more people excited and ready to come back to the ballpark. A walk to Anderson, so two on, two out in the eighth.
Chris Getz is one for four. He was right in the middle of the White Sox biggest inning tonight six runs in the sixth. With a single run scored and an RBI. Ball one inside. A couple of line outs to David DeJesus. But then a single from Pierzynski and a walk to Anderson. Routine for Bloomquist in center field. White Sox scoreless in the eighth. AT&T, the nation's fastest 3G network. AT&T, your world delivered. White Sox in front, 11-2. The Royals have won four of the first five between the two teams. And doing an excellent job of holding down the White Sox offense, but not tonight. 11 runs on 17 hits. And it's former Royal Octavio Dotel. With a 1.17 ERA in 18 games. So Clayton Richard, seven innings, gives up two runs. So Ozzie Guillen's decision to put Clayton Richard in the starting rotation has really paid off in his last three starts. He's given up three earned runs in 20 innings. Luis Hernandez, Willie Bloomquist, and David DeJesus in the bottom of the eighth inning. Hernandez is grounded out and walked. That was the only walk given up by Richard in seven innings. Right to Ramirez at shortstop. And now Mitch Meyer is going to bat for Willie Bloomquist. So Willie ends the night a tough luck 0 for 3. Lined out twice in the first inning to the second baseman Getz, who made a fantastic diving play, the defensive play of the game. And Willie also lined out to center. to Mitch fouls it away in front of 26,495 on a beautiful 
late May evening. Fireworks after the game. Plenty of fireworks during the game, but not the fireworks that the fans wanted to see. Two and two. If Joaquim Soria ends up being the closer that we all think he's going to become, then Octavio Dotel someday might be the answer to a trivia question. Let's say seven, eight, nine years down the road, we can say. Before Joaquim Soria was a closer, he was a setup man who was the Royals' closer at the time. And you would say, Frank White. I would say Octavio Dotel. And I would say, great job. <laughs> great setup. <laughs> That's in the seats. Of course, the Royals went into that season not knowing what they were going to get from Joaquin Soria. The Royals did know that they needed a closer. Dotel was a couple years removed from Tommy John surgery. They were very careful with Dotel. He rarely pitched in back to back games, but spent a little bit of time on the disabled list. But did a Find enough job for the Royals as closer, and then he was trade bait. Was dealt to the Braves, and the Royals got Kyle Davies in that deal. Dotel walks Meyer with one out. And brings up David DeJesus. Octavio Dotel was. The first pitcher in National League history back in 2000 to have in the same season 15 starts and 15 saves and now he's committed a balk. And I'll put Mitch Meyer at second base. So Dotel who began his major league career in the starting rotation for the Houston Astros. He was not happy at first being moved to the bullpen, but ended up being a very good closer. And until he blew out his elbow and then came back and pitched a few games with the New York Yankees. Wasn't quite there. The Royals scouting team, even though he wasn't getting the results, liked his stuff. His velocity was coming back. That sharp slider was coming back. The Royals signed him in 2007. One and one on DeJesus. Now the one thing that really would make any closer put you on the edge of your seat or walks and uh, you look at the 15 innings he's pitched you're looking at about 10. And on the night 11 walks so the, the walks are really the big bugaboo about guys who are closers who keep you on the, on the edge of your seat all the time. One and two on to Jesus. David scored on Billy Butler's two run home run in the sixth inning. Better meet it first to Dotel. Second out of the inning, Meyer to third base. Billy Butler, who has provided the only offensive thrill tonight, 
for the Royals fans with a long home run to left field in the sixth inning against Clayton Richard. Billy oh, picked on a fastball right here, Ryan. I'm kind of waiting to see who's going to be the first one to hit the Hall of Fame, but that was, that was pretty close right there. Want to hit the Hall of Fame? Those are expensive windows out there. I better hope they're. You better hope they're bulletproof or bulletproof, shatterproof, and everything else because it's going to get hit this summer by somebody. <laughs> bulletproof. Yeah, the baseball can break. You need something like the glass that was in the uh, stadium club. You know. Okay. It's got to be shatterproof. Right below the Royals Hall of Fame is former Royal Jimmy Gobble. Billy hits it hard to center. Anderson runs it down in the gap. And that's it for the Royals in the eighth inning. Tonight by Panera Bread. Explore a menu full of hearty soups, hand-tossed salads, inventive sandwiches, and savory breakfast items. Panera Bread, where every detail matters. Wondering about other teams in the Central. The Royals coming in tonight tied for second with Minnesota. Both teams three and a half back. Bottom of the eighth. And this is Willie Ibar. The older brother of the Angels, Eric Ibar, driving in Carl Crawford, making it 5-3 to three Tampa Bay in the bottom of the eighth. And now in the top of the ninth, it's Dan Wheeler pitching for the Rays. John Bale comes on for the top of the ninth inning to face Josh Fields, Scott Pudsednik, and Alexi Ramirez. Now Josh Fields, and if he turns his season around, might point to tonight as a catalyst for that with three hits, a couple of RBIs, two runs scored. He was hitting 229. So he has added 13 points to his batting average. Slow roller to Hernandez. One down in the ninth inning. John Bale making his second appearance since rejoining the Royals, and he was a lifesaver in the game on Sunday in St. Louis. Coming on in the sixth inning to get the Royals out of a jam. A big strikeout of Rick Ankiel stayed on for the seventh. Very important inning in a third for him, and the Royals. Taking the third and final game of that series. 
Ball one to Ponsednik. Uh, John Bell's got that lower arm slot, which gives him a lot of movement and gives him a lot more deception on his curveball. We saw Jimmy Gobble warming up in the White Sox bullpen, and Jimmy's stock dropped with the Royals when. Royals decided that they did not want just a situational left handed pitcher. On Sednik out in a ground ball to Kiaspo two down in the ninth inning. And even now the Royals don't really have or didn't have before Sunday didn't have a left hand pitcher that you would say this guy is above and beyond the best lefty we have. But when Bale drops down with that arm angle there he might be the guy that Trey Hillman goes to late in the game when you need to get a lefty out. Well he's got the deception and he's got the the, uh, the deception on the breaking ball and I think that's what you need to get for a left hander to get a left hander out. He's got to have something to hold him back so he don't go out over the plate uh, as easily on you and he he showed that he, he does have that ability to do that. Alexi Ramirez has a three hit game. Two runs driven in. Every White Sox hitter has scored a run tonight. All but two White Sox have driven in a run. That's among the starters. Center field, Mitch Meyer makes the play. John Bale knocks down the White Sox one, two, three in the ninth. And Jamie Quirk from Rival Sports Bar. Fireworks after the game, but the White Sox provided the in game fireworks. Ryan Bannister allowing seven runs in five innings tonight. Fans are going to ask questions. Frank White will answer. And a preview of tomorrow with Gil Mesh against Mark Burley. And Burley's off to a 6 and 1 start. All that coming up with Joel and Jamie on Boulevard Royals Live. Well, here's Jimmy Gobble. First time we've seen him in another uniform. He was released by the Royals in spring training, picked up by the Texas Rangers, released by them, minor league contract with the White Sox, and recently called up. And this is his fifth appearance. Well, I talked to Jimmy before the game, Ryan, and he said that he really credits uh, Buddy Bell with getting him over to the White Sox and. Seeing enough in him to give him another shot, but he also says he's going back to being over the top with his arm angle, lower three, the, the three-quarter arm slot, going back to his 12 to six curveball, and he wants and he's trying to throw more of a two-seamer, get more of a sinking fastball from that arm angle. 
Frank, I'd say I really thought he had added several years to his career when he went down sidearm a couple of years ago against the left hand batters. I mean, he was nasty against the lefties. And even last year, with all of his struggles as a Royal, he still held left hand hitters to a 200 average. I think he's finding that, the, you know, a situation on lefty doesn't have a, a strong place in the game. So he feels he needs those other pitches to be able to pitch against right handed hitters. You know, when he, when he was at double A, his curveball was more 12 to 6. That was really his signature pitch. And when they dropped down, he felt he lost velocity. So he, in, in going back up to the three quarter arm slot, he said he's still around 90, 91. He wants to get to 93, 94. Mike Jacobs 0 for 3 with a couple of strikeouts. Well, maybe there are some teams who don't value a situational lefty, but there are some who do. I mean, you play a long time for Tony La Russa in St. Louis if you can get some left hand pitchers out. Oh, yeah. Left center field, Pod Sednik retires Jacobs, so Mike 0 for 4 tonight. And Mark Tien with a two hit game comes to the plate. Ten years ago, Jimmy Gobble was a first round sandwich pick, so in between the first and second round of the Royals. I don't remember anything between Mark Tien and Jimmy Gobble, do you? Uh, looks like just a fastball that got, that got away. <laughs> They're grinning at each other. That'll uh, put a spasm in your back real quick <laughs> to get out of where that one. <laughs> and a four pitch walk. Alberto Cayasco, like Tian, has a two hit game. Clayton Richards, seven innings, gave up two runs, six hits. And only two runs. In the bottom of the sixth inning, a two run home run from Billy Butler. Now Jimmy having a tough time throwing strikes. Three and one. So drafted in 99, Jimmy made his major league debut with the Royals in 03. The start against the Tampa Bay Rays here at Kauffman Stadium. Jimmy went to his mouth on the mound, so that's ball four. So Kayaspo will get a walk. So Ed Rapuano, home plate umpire, late in the game is called a block. And if you go to your mouth with the pitcher on the dirt portion of the mound, that is an automatic ball. So with the count three and one, boy, Jimmy sure has a big mouth, doesn't he? <laughs> one and 
What was that? He missed by a long way on that one, didn't he? Wow. 0 oh 2 on Miguel Olivo. Ramirez at short will go to second and that's the game so the White Sox blow out the Royals in game one and win by nine. So an impressive start again for Clayton Richard who improves to two and oh giving up just two runs in seven innings. And a tough loss for Brian Bannister who gives up seven runs in five innings and with a loss tonight the Royals will Finish the month of May below 500. A run.